it is 10 o'clock and we and we have some and uh, we, I think we should get started. Um, so you see my name on there, Christine Stecker, that's me. And I'm going to introduce our today's instructor who is Taylor Jones, who is our 4-H our, uh, agent and how, resident houseplant expert. So Taylor, if you- Enthusiast like is maybe a better word, not expert. Well, <clears throat> on our staff, he is the <laughs> expert here in extension, and that's something because, you know, we know plants, outside plants. Anyway, Taylor's going to tell us about the inside plants. Take it away, Taylor. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank y'all for being here. Um, this is going to be super informal, so if we get to a topic or I say something and you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or turn your mic on or type it in the chat box. I'm going to ask Chris to sort of manage the chat box a little bit so she can see what's happening in there, but we can, uh, we can roll on um, with what we're going to do today. I'm going to try to get my screen shared here. Um, let's see. Can you see my screen? Yep. All right, good. So this morning, we are going to talk a little bit about houseplants. Um, and really, we are just going to sort of go through some of the things I want you to know before you commit to a houseplant, right? Because sometimes we'll, we'll be given a houseplant or we'll go to the uh, big box store and we'll see this really pretty plant. We're like, oh my gosh, I love it. We'll get it. And then we'll get it home and we're like, what in the world have I got myself into? What do I do with this thing? I have no idea. So these are some of the things, first of all, we're going to go over some of the things I want you to know prior to getting your house plant. And then we are going to go through some of the, we're going to go through A to Z um, house plants as far as common house plants that people have. Um, I'm going to talk about the names, the needs, and then I'm going to give you a little probably a few stories of some things um, that I've experienced. I have a bit of a collection here. I don't know what all you can see um, in my video here, but that's just a little, just a little tour of my houseplant room. Um, yes, I said houseplant room um, because my wife has uh, given me a space to put all my houseplants so they're not all over the house. So um, it works out for us and, uh, and we'll talk about spaces and things too. Um, but does anybody have any questions just before we get started? Um, like I said, this is going to be super informal. We're just going to roll right through. And I can only see two or three of you in the little picture here. So like I said, if you do turn your mic on or type a question in the chat box, whatever you want to do. Um, but we're just going to roll right into it. So like I said, I want to talk a little bit about what we think about um, or what I want you to start thinking about before you commit to a house plan, before, you're, before you buy one, before you get one. Um, and first of all is your home inhabitants. Who lives in the house where your house plan is going to be? It's not just you. It may be you, which is a lot easier to sort of think about. But if you have others, you, you want to definitely think about that. Children, pets, significant others. Um, Mainly, we're going to talk about children and pets today, just because a lot of houseplants are actually toxic um, if ingested, you know, by our cats and dogs and um, children. Hopefully, the children aren't eating on your houseplants, but, you know, whatever. Um, but you want to think about it. You know, I don't know, again, if you can see, I've got an approximately eight foot tall cathedral cactus um, that was actually gifted to us um, a couple years ago. I think she... She's about as old as I am, um, and I'm 27, so she, uh, she has been around a long time, but you may not want something like that if you have small kids around, or if you do have something like that, you may want to put it in a corner or somewhere safe, um, and same goes for other things. You know, you don't want this great big old ceramic pot um, with, a, with a four foot tall uh, Norfolk Island pine, um, you know, in, in your main living area if you've got, uh, you know, pets and things because um, they can get in them and destroy them. Quick little uh, tip that I have found that has worked for me. So again, I'm going to give you some, some science-based kind of stuff, but I'm also going to give you personal lived experience. Um, if you've had houseplants for any length of time and you have cats in particular, 
you will know that cats like to get in and play in your house plants. And one tip that I have used that has seemed to work so far, knock on wood, is lemon slices. So if you put lemon slices in your soil with your house plants, it tends to keep your cats out of them. Um, but anyways, and you know, uh, keep talking about the uh, home inhabitants uh, with your plant placement. If you've got children running around, if you've got wild pets running around, you don't want your uh, plants to be in places where they can be knocked down, that sort of thing. And then again, your plant attributes. So again, with my eight foot tall cat this back here, it needs to be in a safe space that, you know, people aren't going to come by and brush up against it or make sure it doesn't fall on anybody and things like that. So another thing you want to think about is your lighting in your home where you can have your house plants. So this is a really interesting image that I was able to find um, with a north facing window and sort of gives you some of the layouts of lighting. Um, so you know, traditionally, when we're thinking about plants outside, we're talking about part sun, part shade, shade, um, full sun, that sort of thing. Well, we sort of uh, talk about it in, in aspects of light. So low light, moderate light, high light, or bright light, um, and then direct or indirect light. So again, you can sort of see some of the areas where we've got, um, you know, we've got these western facing big old, probably, doors or whatever on the uh, on the side there that let in a lot of light and the space right there in front of those are going to be really bright um, and we'll talk about some of the plants that really like that kind of light um, but then you've also got your low light area sort of the corner over there on the right so that would be a good place for um, you know your sa your snake plants um, and, and uh, plants like that um, so this is just a, a really quick little image that sort of gives you a walk around of lighting in your home. So this is another thing you want to think about when you're when you're purchasing or, or getting a house plant is what kind of light can you provide? Therefore, what kind of plant can you can you house and, and do well? Um, and I will uh, share this. I've already shared it with uh, Chris so she can send it out or we can put it on Sugar Den or whatever we need to do with that. But that way everybody will have that. Um, Another consideration is humidity. Um, so some plants like dry uh, air um, and they're from regions of the world that they, you know, there's not a lot of moisture in the air and then some really like moisture. Um, so you can see a couple of images here of some of my plants. Um, these are in two different areas of the house. I actually do have a few plants in other areas of the house just because that's what the, those plants like. Um, but so if you look on the right, um, you have an image that's actually just right up here on my little plant shelf here. It's got my uh, calathea. It's got a trailing philodendron. It's got a uh, type of barrel cactus and then it's got a aloe cousin there in the back. And then on the left, we have a Rex begonia. So, um, you know, two different needs of plants, although the, uh, the trail and philodendron could use a little bit more humidity, but it is generally better off with these other guys. And then my um, Rex begonia um, likes humidity. So um, it's actually near a bathroom. So um, it gets, you know, some of the humidity from, from, the, uh, from the bathroom, taking showers and things like that. But that's, you know, something that you want to think about, too. If you've got orchids or Rex begonias or something like that that really like the humidity, um, you want to take that into consideration when you're placing your, your house plant. Another thing is commitment. Um, so if you are a sort of uh, set it and forget it kind of houseplant uh, enthusiast, um, you know, there are definitely certain uh, plants that would do well for you. Um, you know, it, Contrary to popular belief, orchids, phalaenopsis orchids, actually are better, um, you know, with with less, uh, you know, attention. <laughs> do what, Chris? Less attention. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Less attention. They actually <laughs> do better with less attention. Um, and then, you know, some other things that are going to require a lot more attention and a lot more time, um, especially if you have like a bonsai tree or if you're doing, you know, any sort of uh, propagating, all those kind of things are going to require a little more, um, a little more attention, a little more uh, time commitment. Um, but a lot of your succulents and, and cat time things are going to do really well um, with less uh, intervention and attention as well. So just think about that. Um, so now that we've sort of talked about what we want to know beforehand, we're going to sort of talk about 
some, uh, you know, just our general uh, houseplant facts and knowledge. So um, we've got four different types of houseplant or four different growth habits. So we've got our flowering houseplants, which include your orchids, your African violets, your uh, calanchos, and those sorts of things. You've got um, succulents and cacti, which are a whole different uh, category to themselves. You've got trees. So there's lots of different uh, trees that you can actually bring inside. Um, and of course, tree is sort of loosely termed, I guess you could say, because um, indoors it's sort of a, uh, a forced growth, growth habit, if you will. Um, so again, you've got your bonsai, you've got um, yucca trees, if you've ever seen those. Um, you know, some people do these fancy things with the uh, hibiscus, they put them in swirled little trees and you can bring them in. I've done that before um, and they've actually flowered inside. Um, and then you've also got trailing or vining uh, houseplants like the pothos here, the golden pothos or the devil's ivy um, in this image as well. So those are our four growth types or uh, types of houseplants. Um, another thing you want to think about too with your houseplants is your planters and your pots. Um, so generally speaking, we've got three main categories. Um, you've got your plastic pots. A lot of our plants that we buy come in these plastic pots. Um, we love them and we hate them if we're at all any sort of gardeners. Um, sometimes they do us really well and sometimes they don't. Um, I know when I am gardening outside and I buy these plants and I, I know you're the same way when you go and you see these plants, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to have it. You get it home and you're like, oh my gosh, where am I going to put it? And so it might live a season or two in that pot in your backyard. Um, at least for me, it has. Um, so, you know, we sort of got those uh, sort of love-hate relationships with those. Um, but plastic pots are really good um, for beginner uh, houseplant uh, people. Um, they're pretty forgiving. Of course, you know, um, materialistic, they're plastic. So if they fall, they're not going to break. And you know, that kind of thing. And they also help retain a little bit of moisture inside of your, uh, inside of your houseplant, inside of the soil. Um, but we will talk about this and I will be the first to tell you the number one cause of houseplant death is watering and specifically overwatering. So we'll talk about that when I get to our um, houseplant A to Z. But a lot of times the reason that we lose our houseplants is because we love them to death. Um, we will uh, overwater them and we will uh, cause root rot and all that kind of stuff, um, which tends to happen in plastic pots. Um, another uh, type of pot that I have sort of really gotten to like and love is uh, terracotta. Um, so I'm actually in the process of putting some of my smaller plants in the terracotta just because I like the aesthetic. Um, I like, you know, just how it looks and I like how it does with the plant. Um, I tend to be a little bit of an overwaterer when it comes, you know, to, to my houseplants. So with a terracotta, because it's porous, it actually allows for uh, more air to go through the uh, soil um, for your houseplants and it dries out a little bit quicker um, and a little bit easier um, with your houseplants. So a lot of times people will, uh, you know, obviously do their uh, cacti and their succulents um, and some of those other plants that like to be pretty dry or like to dry out between waterings um, in terracotta. Um, and again, they, they look great. Also, another little tidbit that I have found that's helped me, um, when you break your terracotta pots, because you're going to have one that breaks, um, it actually serves as good um, foundation in other containers. So if you have a great big foundation or a great big container um, that you want to sort of uh, put a little bit of uh, drainage at the bottom, throw in your broken pieces of terracotta at the bottom. It really helps with the uh, structure um, towards the bottom and it helps with drainage as well. So reuse and all that kind of stuff when we can and that's a great way to do that and then lastly we've got our ceramic um you know sort of porcelain ceramic pretty glazed pots um they look really really great um but they're expensive they're usually really really heavy um so again thinking about our home inhabitants if we have a lot of kids or, or pets around um these may not be a great idea just because of the uh danger of breaking and that sort of thing, but they do, they do look great. Some other things that people are starting to see um, or starting to use that I've seen are, uh, you know, sort of recycled items like um, metal. Um, I've seen lots of people use cans and, and different things like that to, to pot up little plants. 
um, inside and out. I haven't really experienced that much, so I can't really give any um, background on, on using that, but uh, I've seen the metal, um, I've seen wood, you know, people using little carved out pieces of wood. Um, and then we'll talk about air plants in a little while, but you can really do lots of things with those and stick them in all kinds of places. So we'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, those are pots. Um, next up is our medium, our growing medium, or our soil, our potting soil. Um, so, uh, you know, you can look on the right at this image, um, and this is a real um, bag of, of potting soil. Um, I can't say which uh, brand, uh, but it is a real life uh, bag of potting soil. So you can see it's got peat moss, uh, forest humus. Um, that's humus, not hummus. Hummus is what you eat with crackers in the morning. Humus is the organic uh, decaying matter on top of the soil surface. Um, we've also got coconut core, perlite compost, and worm castings. Um, so basically in every uh, bag of potting soil, because that's what we're wanting to use with our house plants is potting soil because it has all these really cool things in it. Um, you've got sort of a base of uh, either peat moss or coconut core. Um, specifically with the peat moss, you've got uh, sphagnum peat, um, that was used for a really, really long time. Um, it was pretty acidic, um, but it was actually a layer of um, sort of uh, lichens and moss and uh, reeds and things that are sort of decomposing in, in parts of the world where people actually were going and sort of harvesting it. Um, but because of environmental issues and things like that, that sort of is not being used quite as often. Um, but it is sort of a sort of a base for a lot of things. Now, a lot of people are using coconut core um, because it is a byproduct of the coconut industry. So when they take all the you know meat out of a coconut and things, they're left with the husk, and then they take the core from the husk, and that's an excellent um, potting uh, uh, potting mix piece um, is, is coconut core. Um, next, you've got soil. Um, again, this is not really being used much anymore, but people would, uh, these companies would put soil in that has your uh, makeup of sand, silt, and clay that helps with um, water retention and cation exchange capacity and all those fun things that we can talk about in a soil science class. Um, but they don't use these so much anymore because of the weed seed issues. Um, so lots of times when you would get natural soil, you know, you'd have lots of things inside of it. Um, you also have, you know, whatever is being ran off from, from the neighborhood or wherever the soil was being collected at with uh, runoff and things like that. Um, but that's sort of, uh, sort of some of the structure pieces of your potting mix um, that you should be using um, with your houseplants. You've also got <laughs> vermiculite. Um, vermiculite is, uh, comes from mica um, and it really helps with uh, uh, water retention, water absorption in your, uh, in your potting mix. And then we've also got perlite, um, which is basically volcanic ash. Um, and it is, uh, perlite is neutral because it's volcanic ash. Um, or it, sometimes it's actually slightly uh, alkaline. So with the uh, acidity from your peat moss and your coconut core, the perlite sort of helps balance that out a little bit. Um, and then of course we've got sand that helps with drainage because we've got all these things that are holding water. So we need to have extra drainage because again, we like to overlove our houseplants and water log them. Um, so sand really can help with some of that drainage in there. And then again, wood chips, a lot of times pine bark um, wood chips are found in your potting mix um, to help with structure and things like that. Additionally, you have uh, lots of specialty mixes. Um, so in particular, you, you have um, orchid mix, which is a lot of big chunks of, uh, of bark and uh, it's got some moss in there and things like that because that's sort of what they need to, to, to survive. We'll talk a little bit about our orchids later. Um, and then you've also got like uh, cacti and succulent mixes as well, which have a lot of sand, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, big bulky um, particles like that to help with drainage. Um, and then propagation is another cool thing. This is probably one of my favorite activities um, with plants in general is making more plants. Um, so a lot of things that you can take, um, you know, cuttings from fairly easy. And uh, you can also take uh, like pups off of different Excuse plants. Excuse me, Taylor. There were a couple, qu there were a couple questions in the chat, but 
per okay. per change of things before. Yep. Um, one, well, one was actually a statement. Uh, uh, I have used cayenne pepper to keep cats out of plants. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. A thought. And then, and uh, the other one is a question about. Please speak to using terracotta fragments in planters. I have heard before that you are not supposed to put such a layer in planters. So. Um. So generally speaking, it's not a recommendation um, to, to use those sorts of things. Um, but again, that, that was just sort of one of my personal things that I've done in big planters, especially outside when you're trying to make up for putting so much uh, soil in a pot. Um, so it sort of saves you a little bit um, on your soil cost, but it also helps a little bit with that drainage. Um, but generally speaking, you're right. You don't put like a layer of rock or anything at the bottom. Um, that's just the recommendation. But just from personal experience, mm -hmm. instead of throwing away the terracotta, I like to do that just because it. I like head, to use it in pots that have big holes in the bottom because it a yeah. curved piece of broken pot will keep the soil in the pot rather than running out through the holes. So that's I'll I'll put a few pieces in to cover the holes. Yeah. Not cover the holes, but because they're curved, they just. And plus they make a little bit of air space too. Yeah. I think she's talking about the, the problem with a, putting a layer for quote drainage and and you end up getting perched soil situation where the yeah. there's but that's I don't think the ter big chunks of terracotta are, are gonna be an issue. That's I don't think so because the soil does sort of filter through and sort of makes yeah. up the, the space. Um but again, sort of a trial and error sort of thing. Um, again, that's just something that I do. Uh, it tends to, to work, um, you know, specifically outdoors because I don't really have anything that big in here inside. Yeah. And yeah, space saver for soil too. Yeah, yeah, it really does. It helps with, with you know. It's heavy space. though. It is, it is. Was there another question? That's it. Okay, Co okay, carry on. I did. I didn't know if you wanted me to jump in or not. So. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Um, propagation. So let me um, show you um, real life uh, version here of pots and mothers. Um, so this is a type of agave, and I don't know if you can see that, but it's actually got a pup coming out right there. I didn't do anything special or extra to to make that happen, but because I cared for it, now it's given another plant. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, succulents are really good about that. Um, as far as giving off pups and new, new little plants, um, lots of other little uh, plants will do that too. My uh, Dacumbachia here has done that before. Um, so propagation is really fun. And we'll talk about a few of our, uh, a few of our plants um, that are really easy to, to propagate. Um, Okay, so real quick, I want to do a little activity just so I can sort of understand where all our audience is coming from as far as experience with houseplants. So what I'm gonna do, the way this is gonna work is I'm actually gonna stop sharing our screen for just a moment. Um, and we are uh, gonna do a little activity. So if everybody can pull up the chat window, um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give everybody a few seconds to type in either a uh, houseplant that you currently have or one of your favorite houseplants. But before you send it, I'm gonna count us down and we're gonna do what's called a waterfall. Um, so everybody's gonna type it in and then I'm gonna say three, two, one, and everybody's gonna click enter and then they'll all pop up and we can see everybody's at the same time. Um, so go ahead and, and type in your favorite houseplant or your, um, you know, a houseplant that you have in the chat box, but don't, send, don't hit send I don't yet. know where the chat box is. Okay, if you hover your mouse down towards the bottom, are you on a laptop or a, a handheld device? I'm on device? a phone. On a I'm phone, not, okay. Um, it, should, it should still be down. On the right? The, mm -hmm. wherever, wherever your mute oh, button I see is. It. It's, okay, I see it. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yep. so if everybody will go ahead and type that in on the side, but don't hit enter yet. And I'm gonna give you a few seconds to do it and then we'll type it and then we'll all hit enter. Um, I'll type mine in too, I guess. But then I have to have a favorite. Uh, let's see, probably this one, okay. All right. Everybody ready? Yeah. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready. <laughs> yeah. The few, th the few thumbs that I can see, okay. 
All right. <laughs> Three, two, one, enter. <laughs> no I no idea what they're called. I love it. Okay. Well maybe we'll maybe you'll see a, a picture of one today and uh we can we can nail it um down for you. But very good. So we got uh begonias, Christmas cactus, orchid, pothos, African violet, yes, 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 ferns. Absolutely. Perfect. So I probably should have uh, put African violets because I actually wrote a children's book about African violets. Um, but my absolute favorite favorite is my eight foot cactus back here. Um, <laughs> her name is Mother Pokey um, and she is my favorite. So, all right, let's go back to the presentation. Thank y'all for doing that. That was fun. Um, <laughs> let me pull back up Person's here. Waiting. Sorry, 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 sorry. Who's waiting? Uh oh. What happened? What's oh, on? never mind. You okay? You okay? All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Thumbs up? Okay, cool. All right. So, we'll start off with our African violet. So, like I said, African violets are near and dear to my heart. Um, Streptocarpus. Uh, Titensis. Um, I'm going to butcher some scientific names today, so y'all just be prepared. Um, I try not to do uh, species. I try to keep it to the genus, but anyways. Um, our African violets like moderate to bright indirect light, so thinking back about our image earlier, um, make sure it's indirect because if it's direct, it will burn up. And I actually have an African violet here um, that I um, per se, that somebody um, was on the verge of uh, uh, killing. Um, but a really interesting, talking about watering African violets, um, they like to be watered from the bottom if possible. So if you have them in a tray, or they make these really awesome African violet um, pots that you can get, and they make ceramic ones, they make plastic ones. Um, these were pretty cheap on Amazon, but these are great because you can put water in the bottom of them and it doesn't, um, it doesn't keep them uh, waterlogged. Um, so that's a really, really great um, thing after your violets because um, they actually, if you do get water inside their crown, they can rot. Um, from from that and uh, another thing about African violets is to increase their um, their bloom life. You deadhead, just like a geranium or something like that. You want to deadhead, deadhead, deadhead as much as you can. So as soon as that flower is spent, you want to pull it off as close to the plant as you can, and then hopefully it will, uh, you know, re uh, repopulate with with more uh, blooms. These are really cool um, too because there's actually um, a variety of different colors and things and um, they actually have variegated African violets which I've not been able to find yet. But if anybody has ever seen, if anybody ever sees one, let me know because um, that's the next on my houseplant wish list. Um, they come in all kinds of colors, white, pink, purple, um, bluish kind of. Uh, but anyways, that's our African violet. Our next one is a uh, bird's nest fern. Um, so these are really cool. Oh, hang on, we got something blinking. Let's see. Oh, okay. Let's see. Susan Owen said, I have an African violet okay. pop is from a deer ant melons. It has mites. I took it and it sat out on the front deck because I don't think you can get rid of the mites. I did not have the heart. Get rid of it. It's doing great. It's been rained on. Can the mites be killed? So I can plant. I can keep the plant. Have you ever had this problem before? Okay. So I'm not going to talk a lot about pests today, um, just because there are a ton of pests and there are a ton of ways to get rid of them or not to get rid of them. Um, but generally speaking, inside um, with my house plants, I do, and I'm set to saddle soap. Um, any so it will do. Um, it will help with uh, lots of different things. Um, but another thing I recommend with houseplants is uh, repotting. Um, so if you can, you know, if you have a problem, you, you know, sort of follow the instructions on the label for your insecticidal soap. Do what that says. Repot your plant. Get it a, a nice, clean, new pot. Um, and, and try it that way. Um, but it, it's really hard um, to sort of uh, sort of keep 
um, you know, pissed down, um, especially in, in uh, indoors. Um, but, uh, and a lot of things, a lot of times too, when you, with, with houseplants and pests, you actually bring them in from other things. So you have to be really careful. Um, I do recommend quarantining new plants. Um, you know, if you've got another space that you can put it that's away from your actual, your other plants. So, you know, before I buy a new plant, I don't bring it in here to the plant room first. I put it somewhere else just to make sure that it's not gonna have anything happen to it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so quarantine, set the saddle soap, repotting. Those are my recommendations, generally speaking, for um, for pests as it goes. Um, you can also get rid of leaves. Um, you know, if you have like mealybugs on a plant and it's really on, you know, one or two leaves, you take those leaves out or take those pieces of, pieces of the plant out, um, repot and, and go from there. Um, so it's even blooming, yeah. So, you know, again, a lot of times our, our plants, um, will, will uh, do their thing even when they're stressed. Um, and a lot of times they will, uh, you know, they will go to reproductive growth when they are stressed. Um, so try, have you tried insecticidal soap, Susan? No, okay, yeah. So try that and try repotting it if you will um, and, and let us know if, if that works at all. Um, and they, they do have um, like uh, organic concept silo soaps and things like that. So there's also, uh, you know, there's, there's things to do. So let us know how that goes. Okay, so back to our bird's nest fern. Um, so um, these are really cool. Um, they are actually epiphytic in nature. So they actually cling to trees and things in um, uh, the rainforest and, and places where they're from. Um, they like filter to indirect light. So again, they're from tropical areas. So they are in the understory. They're hanging off the branch of a tree and they're not at the very top. So they're not getting full direct sun. Um, so if you give them full bright direct sun in your home, they'll burn up. Um, and again, with the watering, you want them to stay moist but never soggy. Um, basically, when again, when we're watering, another rule of thumb is to use your thumb when watering. So when, if it looks dry, you stick your thumb in the soil. If, if you know, sort of like when you're baking a cake, when you stick the uh, toothpick in, you stick your thumb in. If it comes out dry, it needs water. That sort of thing. Um, so these guys, you want to make sure they stay watered, um, but not soggy, because they are truly tropical. So they are used to the to the high moisture. They're also used to um, humidity. So these are really good plants if you have, you know, like a bathroom counter or something that you can set them on. They do really well there. Um, these are also cool. They come in two different forms. They have sort of the wavy leaves like you can see in this image here and they have sort of the straight leaves um, but it sort of forms a little cup inside of the middle of there and that's where it gets its name sort of bird nest because um, it looks like a little bird nest and the new fronds come out from the center point of that plant. So those are really fun. Pretty Taylor, easy plants. Yep. Can you uh, mist those Yep, you can. Um, so generally speaking, when we're misting, we just want to mist sort of over um, the entire plant. Um, but when we water, we want to water the soil, right? So we don't want a lot of water sitting on top. And this this one, it shouldn't matter too much because you're not going to have it in direct sunlight anyway. But, um, you know, with the, when we're watering our plants, they're like full uh, direct sun. You don't want to get water on the leaves because it can sunburn them. Uh, but yes, these you can mist, absolutely. All right, let's see. All right, next up is our Christmas cactus. So I know I saw some of those in our waterfall. Um, lots of uh, fun. Um, they bloom, well, so I'll say, mine blooms whenever it feels like blooming. It could be whenever yeah. it's nowhere near Christmas. It could be whatever. Um, uh, Moderate to low indirect light. So they are another one of those sort of uh, back corner plants um, that, that will do just fine uh, with, with low light. Um, you want to keep them mainly moist um, throughout, you know, the growing season um, because they are actually succulents. Um, but if they dry out a little bit, that's fine. These guys are super, super um, forgiving. Um, so they will, uh, they will, dry out Thomas nothing and you'll think they're dead, but then you'll water them or you'll, you know, put some water on them and they'll come right back to life. Um, 
I have, I think I have one. So, bless its heart, is uh, a little cutting that somebody gave me that I have just plum neglected. Um, but as you can see, it's still green and it's growing. But, uh, for forgiving. I like to think these are um, really great for beginners with houseplants um, because they can uh, sort of go either either way. Sorry, my dogs are barking if y'all hear that. Um, but uh, just a little comparison. So we've got Christmas cactuses, but we also have Thanksgiving cactuses. And the main difference um, is that uh, the Christmas cactus, the, the edges um, are more rounded, whereas the Thanksgiving cactus are more short. So I think that's the Thanksgiving cactus that I have. Um, generally speaking, they get their names from when they bloom, but again, I'll be the first one to tell you, plants don't read the textbooks. They'll do what they want when they want, um, especially these guys. But those are super fun to do. Their blooms are beautiful um, when, they, when they do bloom. Lots of white, red, and pink. Um, they, uh, the inflorescence itself is, is, is intricate, and, and it looks really cool. Um, but anyways, so that's the Christmas slash Thanksgiving cactus. Next is dumb cane or Diefenbachia. These are one of my very favorite plants as well. I have a lot of favorites, sorry. Um, it's also called dumb cane, um, but basically these are moderate to low light, indirect light. Again, these are sort of, uh, will, do, will do great on um, neglect. Uh, they, uh, you, you need to keep them moist if you can, um, and these actually do well if you can water them from the bottom too. Um, they just, they, they soak it up through the roots, through the soil surface and, and that sort of thing. Um, but just one thing to keep in mind with this, again, thinking about our inhabitants of our homes, um, these are pretty uh, toxic to children and to um, pets. If they are ingested, they have oscillates inside of them um, that uh, basically give it, give it its name, dumb cane. It, it numbs the, the mucus coatings and membranes and um, can sort of leave you really irritated um, in the mouth and, and things like that. All right, I'm going to check it back up here with the chat. Looks like we have some stuff. Oh, mine bloom, and I bet she's talking about Christmas cactus. I have one that is, I believe, 35 years old. That is super cool. Yep, okay, yep. Love our uh, Christmas cactuses. All right, uh, dumb cane, I think I covered all that. They're super cool. Um, I have one. Um, so they come in lots of different varieties, um, lots of different variegations. This one's pretty small. Um, this is another rescue as well. Um, but uh, we uh, love our uh, Dr. Bacchus. Um, let's see. Perfect. Um, so Echeveria is how I say this. Chris, I may be butchering that too. Um, <laughs> This is the genus, so they've got lots of different species of these, but these are one of the favorite succulents um, of people. They like, to, uh, they like to get these because of their symmetry. Um, they're sort of flat. Uh, a lot of them are sort of flat growing. Um, bright direct light is essential for these guys to thrive because they are from arid regions of the world. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they're true succulents. Um, so as much light as you can get them, um, and then you, for watering purposes, you want to make sure that they, uh, you know, dry out completely through, um, through between each watering. Um, with succulents, a lot of them are super forgiving. This is one of them that is super forgiving. I don't know. No, I don't have one. I have Calancho. Um, but these are super cool um, and uh, easy to grow and they're succulents and they come in lots of different colors and, and shapes too. Um, and again, with the succulent deal, they are super easy to propagate. So you just pop off one of those little leaflets, you let it dry out, form a callus on where you uh, separate it from the plant, you stick it on uh, wet soil or uh, uh, perlite, and it'll pop up a new plant. So the fiddle leaf fig. So I have to be honest, there are lots, there are not a lot of plants that I have had trouble growing. Um, they, uh, th this is one of those that I have trouble with. I've tried three times. I've killed three of them. So I don't want to try them anymore. But they are super fun uh, because they've got a really interesting, ornate looking leaf. 
Um, they get super tall um, indoors. They're, uh, they're sort of related to um, the uh, mulberries and the figs and those kinds of plants. Um, so they actually do really well um, where, they, um, where they grow naturally, but uh, they br like bright indirect light. Um, so again, not right in front of the, the window, um, especially not in front of a south facing window. Um, but they, um, you want to uh, water when the top layer is dry. So again, using our rule of thumb, by using our thumb, sticking it inside the soil, if the soil's dry, um, you know, you want it to, to dry out between waterings. Um, and then in the winter, you want to reduce watering because when the daylight uh, hours go down, so does the production of uh, uh, chlorophyll and so uh, growing slows, so they don't need as much water. Um, this is sort of a medium level of difficulty. Um, it's harder than rubber trees. I have a rubber tree, but um, I have neglected it real bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, like I said, I have not had luck with fiddle leaf fig. Does anybody, ha does anybody have one of these? They're sort of popular right now. I don't see anybody, but anyway. My daughter uh, wants one. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> if, any if anybody has any success with these anytime, let me know, because I need to know your secrets. Um, so moving on to one of our favorite vining or trailing houseplants is the pothos. Um, again, I'm not going to try to butcher that uh, genus or species, um, but they like bright indirect light. Um, they do really well with, uh, with that bright indirect light. Um, they do well in a lot of different uh, sort of uh, types of planters or pots. Um, and you want these guys to sort of dry out a little bit between waterings because you don't want them to be soggy because they will get root rot um, in a heartbeat. Um, but these are super easy to propagate and share. Um, so you just cut them off. They actually grow um, aerial roots at basically every node. Um, and you can cut it off right there. You can stick it in water, you can stick it in soil and then root and you'll have a new plant. Um, I also, uh, have several fish tanks in my house and these are really cool to grow in fish tanks. Um, they do really well in the water for a little while. They actually grow um, and their roots will sort of dangle down into the into the aquarium and, and do their thing. But uh, I love pothos. Pothos are super easy. This is probably again one of those easy ones I would recommend for uh, first timers because um, they're pretty 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 good. Um, Haworthia is another uh, succulent um, that lots of people like to uh, buy just because they look really cool in the uh, store when we go and we're like, ooh, the zebra plant um, so, or the zebra cactus. Um, they look really cool. They're cousins to aloes. Um, again, they like bright direct light. They're, they're true succulents again. They really like that light um, and they are not too much on the water. These are really susceptible to root rot. Um, I don't know if you can actually see in this picture, but that one has a little bit of green on top of the soil. Um, so that one's particularly um, heading for disaster. So hopefully they uh, fix that. But um, these are these are fun. Like I said, they're they're related to aloes. They have those uh, nice little uh, veins that sort of it's it come out um, of the leaf. Um, but they're really cool, and uh, they're also cousins to the Echeveria that we talked about. Um, earlier as well. So they are really fun. Um, let's see. Doreen said, my mother-in-law grew pothos in advice for water for years. Yes, absolutely. Love our pothos for sure. All right. Heterohelix. <laughs> if you have any experience in gardening, you have probably ran across ivy at some point, whether inside or outside. Um, you want to talk about a, a super easy houseplant? In my, in my opinion, in my experience, this is one of them. Um, super adaptable to sun or shade. Um, it enjoys well-drained soil, but again, it's kind of hard to kill this stuff, especially when it's somewhere where you don't want it. Um, but it, uh, it, it, it's great. It's a, it's a trailing or a vining um, plant. It looks really nice in, in pots you know, sort of high up so it can sort of trellis down. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's sort of one of those easy ones. Um, it's, it's sort of uh, hard to get rid of outside. Um, but uh, yep, that's ivy. <coughs> so uh, jade or uh, crassula species. Um, so again, this is a succulent. It's lights uh, bright 
bright direct light is fine. Um, I have one here that I'm planning on um, making into a bonsai. Um, they are super easy to do that. Um, they're also succulents again, so they're easy to propagate and make more of. Um, but they don't like a lot of water. Um, there's lots of different types of J2, um, but generally speaking, they don't like a lot of water and they like even less than that amount of water in the winter time when they're not growing so much. Um, but they're super fun because they, um, you can sort of bend them and move them a little bit. They sort of got a little bit of a stretch to them, um, especially when they're, the new growth is, is sort of tender. So you can twist them around and do stuff like that. Um, but they're super, super cool. Um, they're, they're also a pretty, pretty easy uh, houseplant um, as well. So Calancho, um, and I may be saying this wrong, but that's how I've always said it, Chris. Um, Calancho, donkey's tail, um, another succulent. Um, they uh, moderate indirect light though. They don't like the uh, full, full lights um, just because of their, uh, uh, you know, sort of their structure and, and a lot of times their uh, leaves are uh, not all green so they can't photosynthesize as much so they don't need as much light. Uh, I have a little baby one down here. Um, so you can see this one's got the little purple uh, leaf margins. Um, super easy. Um, allow drying out between um, waterings. And some of these, uh, and again, this is just a genus, but some of these are actually um, hardy outside in uh, USDA hardiness zones eight through 10, um, just depending on the variety, but uh, they are, they're pretty cool. Um, so again, I sort of uh, throw this next one in the lump with uh, Ivy, um, Lucky Bamboo, uh, Dracaena sandariana, um, bright indirect light, um, keep moist but not soggy or submerged. We're busting myths today. You cannot grow this long term in water. Um, so a lot of times these things are um, marketed and sold in water or in vases with a few rocks and just water. Um, it'll last for a little bit, but that's it's not going to sustain itself um, because they are not um, made for that. Um, that's just sort of one of those industry poise that happened, but I am here to tell you that it does not work out. Um, but again, these are super fun to do. Um, they also can be, you know, sort of manipulated to, to grow into different little shapes and things. Um, relatively easy. Um, if you have any garden or plant experience, you know, bamboo is, is uh, again, hard to get rid of once you have it. Um, so you can uh, do the same thing with uh, lucky bamboo. Monstrera. Um, so Monstrera is the genus. Again, these are sort of one of those hot plants right now, um, sort of like the fiddle leaves. Um, they like bright to low, um, indirect light. So again, they're sort of adaptable on the light spectrum. Um, but you want them to, uh, these are, these love moisture, love humidity, love water. Um, so you want to make sure that they are watered moderately and evenly, uh, but never soggy. Um, there are, um, sort of upright versions of this, and there's also uh, vining versions of this, um, but this is uh, sort of one of those that's more on the, um, higher on the difficulty list than some of our other ones that we've talked about, but they're super cool. Um, I have a Swiss cheese plant, which is sort of a cousin to this, um, that's growing in my office, and if you've ever been to our office, you know we don't have a lot of light anyway, but it seems to do well, um, so again, I can attest that they are pretty um, adaptable with whatever you're doing, but just remember that they are, um, they like the moisture, they're, they're, they're tropical. Um, Nepeta, so this is sort of a stretch as far as uh, houseplants go, but I do know that some folks like to grow it and like to grow other herbs indoors. Um, I've grown lots of different herbs indoors and it seems to work. Um, but cat mint, it likes moderate indirect light. Um, it does best when soil is kept damp. Um, and again, many herbs are easy to grow indoors. Um, all right, so again, shocker, one of my favorites is the Phalaenopsis orchid. So there are lots of different orchids, um, but the, uh, the phalo is what some people say, but the Phalaenopsis orchid is one of those traditional houseplants that lots of people like to, uh, like to grow. Um, they like bright indirect light. Do not put them directly in the direct sunlight because they will burn, they will um, scorch, and they won't produce flowers for you. Um, 
with watering these guys, these you can uh, water from underneath too, depending on what kind of pot they're in. Um, and speaking of pots for these guys, they like to be sort of cramped up in their pot. Um, so a lot of times when you buy these guys, they are in a little cup and they're sort of little cramped up. Um, that's what they like. Um, and when you repot orchids, um, you'll know when you need to repot orchids when all of their aerial roots are coming out um, and turning white outside of their pot. Um, but another myth buster, don't use ice um, to water these guys. I know lots of people do. I know lots of people tell lots of people to use ice, um, but I would rather you, you know, sort of water them from the underneath or just water them a little bit, um, you know, without getting water on the um, on the leaves or in the crown of the plant, because again, it can rot from, from the crown of the plant. Um, but ice can actually damage the roots. It can damage the leaves if it touches the leaves. Um, and, and plus it's sort of, while it's a great um, sort of way to, to water other things because um, it, it's sort of a slow water and a slow release of water. Um, since your phalaenopsis orchids have aerial roots, it can damage those roots um, and, and cause lots of problems. Um, and again, they are epiphytic in nature. So they're growing in the tops of the trees and the rainforest and things. Um, or at Disney World, if you've ever been to Animal Kingdom, they've actually got phalaenopsis orchids hanging in the trees there. Uh, but they like their humidity. So again, these guys do really well in kitchens and uh, bathrooms. Um, so that's the phalos, the phalaenopsis orchids. Philodendrons um, are really cool too. They have upright and um, uh, trailing varieties. So I don't know if you can see, I've got a, a trailing variety. Um, it sort of has gotten crazy. It's growing all over the room here. Um, but uh, they are, they're super easy. Um, bright and direct light for these guys. They like uh, drying out between um, waterings. That's why I have it over here um, with some of my cat tying things. Um, and again, they're easy and there are lots of uh, different colors and variations and um, uh, variegations and, and that kind of thing too. So, all right, Rex begonias. I've got my little Rex begonia here. Um, these are really fun. Um, I know lots of people said they, they like uh, the angel wing begonias. Those are pretty cool too, um, but I like my Rexes um, mainly because I like to propagate these by leaf vein cuttings. Um, so you take a leaf, you lay it on the uh, soil or the perlite, you cut the vein um, and, it, and it grows from there. Um, so those are pretty cool. Um, bright indirect light for these guys as well. Um, I just moved this one in here um, just to, to show you guys, um, but it's going to go back in its original uh, home after this. Um, let it uh, dry out between watering, um, but uh, don't let the uh, um, leaves wilt um, because once they wilt, they are pretty much gone. Um, so keep sort of keep that in mind. They also benefit from watering underneath. Um, so with this one, actually, it's actually in a plastic pot inside of the decorative pot. So I put water in the decorative pot that doesn't have a hole in the bottom um, so it can soak up the water through there. Um, but lots of lots of different col colors. Again, it's really easy to propagate by leaf vein cutting um, and does really well with that. Um, the flera, um, the umbrella plant um, is really, uh, really fun. Um, it likes bright indirect lights, uh, regular moisture, including humidity. So again, this is one of those that you can uh, spray off. I've got a variegated version here. Um, it does really well. It actually won a uh, white ribbon at the state fair last year. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, but uh, they are, uh, they're easy to grow. Um, again, they like their moisture. Um, but unfortunately, these are really toxic to, to pets too. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, Plantsia, air plants. So who has air plants or who has ever tried air plants? Anybody? Yeah, so, so air plants are tricky um, or they can be tricky. Um, they like bright and direct light. Um, the main thing with these guys is the watering. Again, we, we, if there's one thing I want you to learn today, it's not to overwater your houseplant. Um, but basically these guys during the growing season like to be um, either soaked once a week or misted every day. And that's during the spring and summer when there's longer days um, and they, they have longer periods of light. Um, and then in the winter, you can sort of uh, slow that down a little bit. Um, but these air plants, Tillandsia, comes in lots of different varieties. They come in different colors. Um, they actually do have a little bit of a, 
uh, inflorescence when they bloom. I mean, it's pretty interesting looking. If you ever look these up, you can look up Tillandsia flowers. Um, the inflorescence is, is sort of a straight shoot, but they're, they're kind of cool. Um, but you can also do lots of different things with these. So I have a little display um, of air plants that uh, you can sort of put in cholo wood um, and, and different, different ways to, uh, to uh, present these in your house and relatively easy. All right, let's see, we're flashing up here. Let me see what's happening. Let's see. Uh, I have one plant in a tiny jack-o'-lantern I bought last year. I had an air plant growing in a piece of core for probably 20 years before it died. Yep. Um, I have an air, air fern in my, yeah, so they're also called air ferns um, uh, in my shower stall on the upper ledge. It loves it there. Yep. Again, it loves the, uh, the humidity for sure. ANA plants. Um, oh, does ANA have, have air plants? Okay. That's cool. I didn't know that. Um, all right, let's see. Next. All right. Venus flytraps. Who's tried Venus flytraps inside? They're tricky. Um, so this is another one that is on my list that I can't grow very well. Um, so they, uh, they, they like their uh, bright to low light. They're sort of uh, adaptable in that, in that area. Um, fun fact, if you didn't know, they are native to our state um, down in Brunswick and New Hanover counties. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but we've also got other, uh, you know, uh, carnivorous plants um, like pitchers and sundews and things. Um, these guys, you must use rain or distilled water. And that's where I have trouble because <laughs> um, I have uh, lived in two places um, in my adult life. Um, one that had city water and one that has well water. Neither one does well. So I'm basically giving up on these guys. Um, but uh, they really like well-drained soil, um, but they like to, to have that special uh, rain or distilled water. Um, and they're great bog garden plants, so they do really well outside um, if you have the right place for them. I know at Arbor Gate, we, there's some out there. Do they overwinter, Chris, pretty well? Uh, they did overwinter for us, but uh, the one that we had in the bog garden did great until it was stolen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, mean people. But yeah, so, you know, they are adaptable here because they are from here, um, which is which is super cool. You just have to make sure that they get, you know, their water needs and, and their uh, their light. Um, so yeah, Venus flytraps. If anybody has any tips on Venus flytraps, please let me know because they're super cool, but I just can't get them to grow. All right. One of our last ones, um, Wandering Dude. Um, so, uh, these guys like bright indirect light. Um, they uh, water um, from the bottom if possible. These are another one of those trailing plants. So they're really cool um, structurally, um, but uh, they uh, like to be watered from the bottom and if possible. Um, but overall, just keep them moist. You don't want them to dry out because they can, um, you know, sort of get scorched a little bit and, uh, and not do well for you. Um, uh, these are uh, great for beginners, um, not beginnings. Um, and they trail really nicely. They, they fall down. Um, the longer they get, which is super cool, and they're easy to propagate. Again, you just cut them at those nodes, and you can stick them and root them, and it's super easy. Um, yucca or yucca um, depends on who you ask. Um, I say yucca, um, but these are succulents. This was actually one of mine. Um, I sort of call it a fingernail yucca because it's got sort of those stringy things that come off of it. Um, but they like bright indirect light. Um, actually did a little uh, rock scree garden at my old house. Um, and this guy was in it and did really, really well. Um, unfortunately, it, it stayed with the house, but uh, super cool outside. It, it, it overwintered two winters for me outside, but they also make really great indoor plants, um, just like, uh, you know, some other succulents and cacti that we have. Um, when I, when we were talking about the different types of different forms of houseplants, talked about the trees and, um, some folks actually grow sort of these, like in these little tree things. I'm not sure how that even works, but, uh, yucca trees, um, are pretty cool. Um, and, uh, again, they, uh, water and occasionally let dry out between, uh, each watering. Um, and then again, some of these are hardy in zone, uh, USDA hardiness zone 7B, which is where we are. Um, and uh, so, yeah, super cool. 
And then lastly, on our last plant of the day, um, we have the ZZ plant. Um, so if you've ever been to our office, you know that our wonderful Cynthia has a humongous, beautiful ZZ plant that was brought in. Um, these guys uh, are sort of adaptable. Um, they like bright light if they can, um, but again, they, it's not essential to their growth. Um, and again, they're really forgiving with watering, um, but you just don't, you want to make sure you don't overwater these guys because they have rhizomes that sort of sit at the top of the uh, soil surface. Um, so you don't want to have it too wet or they will, um, you know, not do well, they'll, they'll rot. Um, again, great for beginners, not beginnings. I don't know what I was doing when I was typing this out, but um, great for beginners, um, easy plant to sort of start off with. They sort of have those little rhizomes, like I said, and they sort of shoot off these little um, uh, branches of, of leaves. Um, and uh, uh, once you once you figure out their water and they're, they're super easy um, to, uh, to grow. Um, so with that, that is my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and see if anybody has any questions. And while y'all are thinking of those, I'm going to go to the chat. Let's see what we got. Um, oh, okay. Susan said bought one last year in a tiny jack o' lantern. That's super cool. Um, I have flap traps growing in my yard, but I tend to kill them as houseplants. Yep. I, I'm telling you, the, the fly traps are, are on my list with the uh, fiddle leaf feeds and those things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kathy said, I hope the person who stole the Venus fly trap uses city water. <laughs> I, don't, I don't wish it harm. I, know, I, yeah. I, hope it, I hope it's living and prospering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyways, what do we, is there, are there any questions? Are y'all good? Thank you, Taylor. Oh, Very good. Yeah, Could absolutely. Could you speak to uh, repotting, somebody said? Yeah, Jackie wants to know what about repotting. She tends to kill what she repots, so that's a shame. Okay, um, so generally speaking, repotting, um, people like to go too large too quickly. Um, so people like to take a four inch little plant um, that sort of has become root bound and stick it straight into an eight inch pot, um, but you need to put it in a six inch first. Um, so lots of people like to sort of, oh, well, I'll put it in this great big old pot and it'll do great and it'll grow into it, negative. Um, so you want to take stepping stones when you're repotting your plants. Um, like I said with the uh, orchids, the Phalaenopsis orchids, they like to be compact and tight anyways, um, but a lot, of, a lot of other plants sort of like that too. Um, with my uh, um, little split leaf philodendron here, I don't know if you can see. Um, but she actually has aerial roots um, that are spiraling up top of the, of, the, of the pot and she's doing fantastic. Um, and uh, so again, when you when you're repotting, make sure that you're not trying to jump too big too quickly. Um, that's my advice on that. Good question. Good question. And we sort of talked about um, pest control a little bit too. So again, um, sort of just making sure that we're doing our quarantine. So when you buy a new one, don't bring it in. If you've got a room like mine, don't bring it straight in here with everybody else. Um, sort of give it a little time by itself somewhere um, and uh, make sure it's not going to, you know, have any diseases or make sure, you know, look it over really well when you get home. Make sure it doesn't have any mealy bugs or anything like that on it. But, um, you know, if, if you do end up with an infestation of something, use your insecticidal soap. There's lots of uh, options for that. And uh, use, uh, if you know, when you use your insecticidal soap, um, repot it as well, because a lot of times a clean pot will, uh, will help with, with that sort of thing as well. So, any other questions I can help with? Not seeing any. Well, so I do work with Chris and Mark and everybody else. So if you do have uh, questions that come up, let me know. Um, I do uh, hear lots of houseplant questions when they come into the office, um, so I try to help when I can, but uh, I love houseplants, I love plants in general, but I especially love houseplants, so uh, if you ever just want to chat about houseplants, then we can do that too. But otherwise, I appreciate y'all being here today, and uh, I'll leave it, I'll push it back to Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you. Just, I do want to remind everybody if your house, any of your house plants have been spending the summer outside, 
got to bring them in before, actually you should bring them in now because they really don't want to be below 50 degrees and uh, inspect them for any unwanted visitors. So if there are insects or, you know, if anything's been having a party in the pot, you might want to leave it outside. Yeah. So anyway. I know lots of people who have brought in tree frauds and other things inside. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You might want to check it out. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Taylor. That was great. And uh, the recording right. of this will be up on YouTube sometime today. Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody.